Hi everyone, welcome to another video for research design and analysis. In today's video, we're going to be talking a little bit about standardized effect sizes, uh, specifically R squared, eta squared, and the, the partial eta squared that we might calculate in effectorial analysis of variance. So this is building on our previous videos where we we're talking about a multifactorial ANOVA, uh, where we had a hypothetical experiment where there was a dietary intervention and an exercise intervention. So we had um, a, a level or a factor of diet where there were, were two levels. You were either on the control diet or the low carbohydrate diet. Uh, and then there were three different levels of exercise, either low, medium, or high. So we needed one contrast coded predictor to represent the effect of diet, two contrast coded predictors to represent the effect of exercise, and then we needed a further two contrast coded predictors to represent the diet by exercise interaction. And then this makes up our full regression model that we're using in this analysis of variance. We use one degree of freedom to calculate the omnibus effect of diet. We use two degrees of freedom to calculate the omnibus effect of exercise. And we use two degrees of freedom to calculate the diet by exercise interaction. So if that feels unfamiliar to you, you can go back and watch the previous videos in this section. But this is what we were building up to. And in the previous video, we had calculated this uh, full analysis of variance table where we had walked through the sum of squared errors explained by each of these effects. Uh, the omnibus effects right, are denoted with the bolded and underlined degrees of freedom, right? and then the individual contrasts that, that, the, that make up those effects are shown below. And we had worked our way across from left to right, showing that once we know the sum of squared errors explained by each effect, we can divide it into the mean squared error that's explained by that effect, and then we can calculate the F ratio by taking the mean squared error of the effect divided by the mean squared error of the residuals. And then we can calculate a p-value for that F ratio under the null hypothesis to say, you know, how likely is it that we would observe an F value that large or larger, assuming that there was in fact, you know, no relationship between those variables. So those F values and p-values are very informative because they tell us about, you know, the probability of observing an effect that large or larger under the null hypothesis. But how big is that effect, right? And how, how, you know, how much should we be concerned about it or how important is it? Because after all, something might be uh, statistically significant, but it might be very, very small if we've got a big sample and a lot of precision, right? So the statistical significance versus the practical significance of our effect um, are, are things that often go together, but they don't necessarily go together. So one way of trying to understand how kind of practically significant, which is to say how large the effect is, is represented in the effect size. Uh, now there are some other concerns with this because obviously there's the effect that we observe in our sample, but we know that due to sampling variability, the true effect could be anywhere within a, you know, a confidence interval uh, of, of what we observe in the sample. So we don't necessarily want to just stick with the point estimate that we observe in our data, um, but looking at these measures of standardized effect size is a kind of useful way to get started on this, on this idea. So first, let's focus on this far right-hand column of our analysis of variance table. Because after we have all of this in place, we can calculate standardized effect sizes such as the R squared, uh, which has a re uh, relatedly in, in the analysis of variance context, you'll often also see this as eta squared, which is this kind of N-shaped Greek letter here. Uh, but the, the omnibus kind of R squared or eta squared can be calculated by the full model. These other things down below, we're gonna call partial eta squareds. And we're gonna focus on the partial eta squared um, because it's a very uh, common effect size um, in, in a lot of stats programs that people might use. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of these two things at the end, but just to help orient you, for this first row, we're gonna calculate an R squared. For everything else down below, we're gonna calculate a partial eta squared. So hopefully R squared feels a little bit familiar because we've talked about it in previous videos, but remember that R squared reflects the proportion of the variance in the Y variable, right, in the dependent variable, that is being explained by the full model. So to calculate R squared, we take the total sums of squares explained by the regression and divide by the total sums of squares, right? So this is essentially how much variance did we explain divided by how much variance was there to begin with. And if we look at this, this is a pretty astronomical R squared value. We explained 95% of the variance uh, in this dependent variable with our diet and exercise intervention. Um, I, I would say that's you know, nice for a textbook example, it's pretty rare you're going to encounter an R squared that big in practice. And in fact, if I saw an R squared that big, I would probably go back and double check everything I did just to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. Because uh, it's going to be pretty rare that we can explain 95% of the variance in something. 
These other uh, effect sizes, though, are new, these partial eta squareds. We've not calculated these before, um, but conceptually they are related to the R squared. Um, you, so this partial eta squared is a standardized effect size that tells us about the proportion of the variance explained by a single predictor after accounting for all of the other predictors in the model. Um, so formally, this is the sum of squared errors of the effect divided by the sum of squared errors of the residuals plus the sum of squared errors for the effect. So let's pause for a second and think about what that means. Sum of squared errors of the effect is pretty straightforward, right? That is the variance that's explained by diet. So the numerator here is, is identical to what we've seen in you know, previous R squared calculations. This denominator, however, is a little bit different. It's not based on the total sum of squared errors. It's based on the sum of squared errors of the residuals plus the sum of squared errors explained by the effect. So conceptually, what's that, what that is saying is, how much error would we have left over if we hadn't accounted for this variable, right? So if we hadn't included diet in our model, what would the sum of squared errors of the residuals be? And the sum of squared errors of the residuals, if we didn't include diet, would be equal to what it currently is, plus all of the variability that explained, that's explained by diet. So essentially, we're taking the variance explained by that effect and adding it back into the residuals to say, okay, after accounting for everything else in the model, what was the residual variance? And in this case, right, that's 450, that's getting explained by the effect, plus 50 in the residuals. Uh, so 450 divided by 500 is 90, or 0.90, 90%. So about 90% of the variance that remains after all the other variables were accounted for got explained by diet, right? So you, and you can see then that we apply this calculation um, both for individual contrasts and for omnibus contrasts, right? So for the diet by exercise interaction, we need two contrast coded predictors in order to represent that omnibus test, and a total of 57 squared errors are explained by that interaction. So we can calculate a partial eta squared both for the omnibus test, where again we take the variance explained by that effect. So this is the variance explained by both predictors as a set. And then we divide by the combined residual and effect variance to say, well, how much variance remained to be explained after accounting for all of the other factors? And in this case, you know, 57 out of 107 is about 53%. Um, so 53% of the variance that was left over after accounting for diet and exercise got explained by the diet by exercise interaction. And then similarly, after doing this for the omnibus test, we could also do it for the individual coefficients. The formula remains exactly the same, right? It's just that now we're looking at the sum of squared errors explained by this single predictor. So it would be nine, right, as the variance explained by the effect, divided by nine plus 50, because we're adding this variance back into the residuals to say, well, how much could have been explained if we didn't account for this? So it's nine divided by 59 is about 15%. Uh, you know, so that's not a, not a big reduction. Um, and, and so we would say there's about a 15% of the variance uh, that could have been explained, got explained by the, this, this contrast-coded predictor. So one thing to note here is that these partial eta squareds do not add up to the total R squared or the total eta squared. Uh, and the reason for that, right, is that the denominators in these things are different. In the partial eta squared, we're saying if we accounted for everything else in the model, except diet, right, so we're adding 450 back onto 50, how much of that total variance got explained by diet? So it's 450 out of 500, right? Similarly with uh, uh, exercise, we're saying how much of the variance was explained by exercise? So if exercise wasn't there, we'd have 453 plus 50, or 503 squared errors that could be explained, right? So this has a denominator of 503 uh, rather than a denominator of 500. And for the interaction, the denominator is even more different because it's 57 plus 50. So this has a denominator of 107, right, rather than a denominator of 500 or, or 503. So when you're doing this partial eta squared calculation, all of these denominators are going to be different. Um, and they're also all going to be different from the denominator in the R squared calculation which is the sum of squared errors total. So because all of these denominators are different, we're not dividing up you know, pieces of the same whole. Um, that, so this has some strengths and some limitations. Um, so it does make this easier then to compare partial eta squares across different studies. Because for instance, if you said, well, we're going to stick to just the sum of squares total that we have here, uh, and we're gonna say what remained unaccounted out of that total, 
then you're assuming that someone else might have exactly the same statistical model with exactly the same factors that you had in order to make those different comparisons. By partialing out the eta squared and to say, okay, after accounting for everything else, um, and then we'll just look at the, the, the you know, what, what was left over and what got explained as a proportion of what was left over, you have a more generalized effect size um, that, that you can use across different studies where someone else might have only had, you know, two levels of exercise, or maybe that person had, you know, three levels of diet. Um, and, and by standardizing the effect size in those ways, you can kind of um, make it mathematically simpler uh, to compare effect sizes across different studies. Although you also run into some conceptual issues there of, you know, is it an apples to oranges comparison? If, you know, diets, you know, I might operationalize diet in one way in my study, someone else might have a very different manipulation of diet. Therefore, it's not really appropriate to compare our two effect sizes, even though mathematically you can, because if we have two different diets, it doesn't make sense to, to compare them and say, are these approximately the same size in that way? Um, but the problem with having that kind of added flexibility is that the partial eta squared no longer has a straightforward interpretation uh, the same way that the R squared does, uh, right? R squared tells us about the proportion in Y that got explained by X. So that is still abstract, but it's a pretty straightforward idea. It is the proportion of the total variance that got explained by all of our predictors. Um, so we can see the, how that is an informative uh, number to have. If we have a partial eta squared though, right, the, the issue is that this, these, this can lead us to kind of very different results. So for instance, if we look at the effect of X5, right, so if we look at this contrast coded predictor in our diet by exercise interaction, it explained 48 squared errors. If I look at that as a total of the total squared errors, right, it only explained about 4.8%. But if I look at that as an explanation of the residual variance, right, what was left over after all everything else was accounted for, it's actually explaining 49%. Um, so the partial eta squared actually looks pretty big, but as a proportion of the total variance, that actually looks pretty small. Um, so this is nice in, in that using this denominator then allows us to more easily compare effect sizes across different studies but it can also be slightly misleading because it really depends on how much residual variance is left over. Because if I'm explaining you know, one squared error, if I'm explaining one squared error out of two that are left over, I've explained 50% of the variance. But if I'm explaining one squared error out of 100 that are left over, I'm only explaining 1% of the variance. So these standardized effect sizes can be very useful, um, but there are some conceptual problems with them that you need to be aware of anytime you see these kind of presented in a manuscript um, or, or that you're getting them out of a stats program. So why do we like these standardized effect sizes if they can be confusing and difficult to work with? Well, standardized effect sizes do have a lot of advantages. So you know things like R squared, things like partial eta squared, or things like a Cohen's D if we only have like a two group comparison. Uh, and I, we've talked about this before, but remember Cohen's D tells you about the difference between two means divided by the standard deviation. So it tells you how big a mean difference is in units of standard deviation. Right, so these are all what we would call standardized effect sizes um, because regardless of what the manipulations were or regardless of the precise variables used, we can calculate an R squared, a partial eta squared, or a Cohen's D for anything, and then mathematically, we can compare them. You know, conceptually, we have to worry, does it make sense to compare them? But mathematically, then those things would all be on the same scale. Uh, and that, that then loses information because the units are arbitrary, but that can be really helpful because if the units are arbitrary, I can, for instance, compare across two different uh, methods for measuring impairment or two different methods for measuring depression, right? If people have slightly uh, different experimental designs and either the variables that they're using or their manipulations that they're using, these standardized effect sizes can be really helpful. Um, also, these usually make some combination of like a signal to noise ratio, right? There's some combination of the raw effect size and the variance that then makes it easier to do power calculations. Um, so as we'll talk about in some future videos, if we're doing a power calculation, right, we'll often start with a Cohen's D or we'll start with a partial eta squared or we'll start with an R squared um, because that actually makes the math of the power calculation easier. Now the problem, of course, if we contrast these standardized effect sizes with what you might call a raw effect size, 
is that raw effect sizes tend to be much more clinically useful. And the reason for that is that raw effect sizes use real units, right? They talk about real differences or real relationships that are easier to understand. So, you know, if I say that um, your, your walking speed was improved by 0.8 meters per second with a 95% confidence interval of 0.4 to 1.2, you know, okay, this was the average improvement that we saw in the sample, but the true improvement could be as little, you know, as this or as high as this to a 95% level of confidence. So presenting a raw effect size as both a point estimate and a confidence interval is often much more clinically informative because those real units are meaningful in a, in a practical context, right? Is that, is that a useful improvement in gait speed beyond being a statistically significant improvement in gait speed? Now, the limitation of this, right, is that then there are some drawbacks if we actually have specific units because a little more work is going to be needed if we're going to conduct a power analysis because usually we'll have to convert this effect size into something like a Cohen's D in order to do the power analysis to start with, um, right? Uh, and we can have some issues if things are measured in slightly different ways between studies. So for instance, I might have a, a something like gate speed is pretty straightforward because we're going to measure speed in you know some form of distance per time and I can always convert you know, centimeters per second into meters per second if I have to. Um, but think about if I have two different depression inventories, right? So those depression inventories might measure depression on different scales. And if I have, you know, a six point change on one scale versus a two point change on the other, are those the same? Is one really three times bigger, right? Uh, if I'm measuring kind of psychological constructs or things don't, that don't have fixed physical units, these raw effect sizes can be really hard to interpret, and we're often going to be better off uh, switching to some kind of standardized effect size in, in those situations. And there are things that are going to be along a spectrum where, you know, in some ways it could be physically measured, but there might be differences in the precise way in which it is measured. Uh, and the degree to which there are multiple ways of measuring something, standardized effect sizes might start to become more common. And then as you have something where a, you have a very concrete system of measurement, raw effect sizes are probably going to be more common and more useful. In general, though, as researchers, you're going to find situations where you like a standardized effect size, for instance, doing a power calculation. But there are going to be other situations where you really like a raw effect size. For instance, did you achieve some minimal clinically important difference, right? And, and being able to work with both of them and translate between the two is an important skill to have moving forward.